Earthlings, welcome. So, Hello. Hello. <laughs> that was like uh, Hello. listening to a golden oldie, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. It was really strange, actually. It's like familiar, but kind of, oh, that's yeah. kind of retro <laughs> now. <laughs> you, you said the word familiar on purpose, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so welcome back, everyone. I know we've had a little break, so we're really excited to be back. And we always feel a bit rusty when we've had a break, but it will all turn out in the wash, as they say. In fact, I guess has just the thing in the background of her screen to sort that out. We have a guest. Um, yes. We have a guest. Who is this guest? Where, where, where? Where can the guest be? <laughs> I think we've probably, I think we've probably done enough of this already. So, uh, <laughs> welcome. Whey! Oh, hello, Corey. <laughs> That's, for the, That's <laughs> for the washing machine. That's for the washing machine. So yeah, Corey's got the washing machine in the background to sort everything out. But yeah, welcome back, Corey. So Corey has a couple of forthcoming books. One of them is going to be on vegan feminism, which I also can't wait for. But this one, I know, Corey, this is your pet project, as you call it, and um, very, uh, very unusual, but really exciting. I, I love the proposal that, you, that you've done. And it's all about vegan witchcraft. So welcome. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, first off, thank you for having me on your return show after the long break. Yeah, I, I guess um, I have to start with this book by saying that I kind of started it as um, I'll just kind of tinker with this while I'm working on other projects sort of thing. And when people would ask me what I was, what I'm writing, what I'm currently doing, and I would mention that amongst my other stuff, and it would always pique people's interest. What? Vegan witchcraft? What is that? <laughs> And there's really, there's so much to unpack with this whole concept of vegan witchcraft. It's really, really difficult, I think, to, we'll, we'll try today. But there's a lot of um, interesting overlaps when it comes to uh, spirituality, when it comes to pagan history, agricultural history, social movements, social justice stuff. So really, the book started from, well, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a witch myself. Um, completely atheist. So my witchcraft was certainly secular. And in the past, I've written quite a bit about atheism because that's that's how I identify as atheist. And um, I've also written about the importance of science and rationality in our, in our social movement work as animal rights activists. But because I'm also doing this kind of witchcraft stuff just for fun, just because, you know, that's stuff that keeps me happy and healthy, um, I've been reading more about it, and the more I read into it, it's really actually something I only got back into in the past few years, I should say. When I was a, a kid, I was really into it, and then, you know, you go through your 20s, and you're like, I'm too cool for that, and then I come back to it. It's like, well, I'm 40 now, and I'll do what I want. <laughs> but it was kind of like coming back to it and reading a lot more that uh, I had access to when I was a kid and just realizing there are so many missed opportunities with the modern witchcraft practice. And I should also say for people who aren't aware Witchcraft is a it's a subculture and it's practiced all over the world. But specifically what I'm talking about today is what's practiced in the U.S., Canada, Ireland uh, and the U.K. And basically it is a it's a modern it's a modern spiritual or secular practice. In a lot of ways, it's quite eco feminist. In a lot of ways, it celebrates our relationship to nature and with other animals. And a, a lot of it also is, especially for people who are practicing it um, secular, as a secular practice, you know, it's, a, it's kind of like a, it's a way to kind of focus your thoughts. It's also, there's a lot of meditation involved in it and ritual practice and that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, I guess yoga in a way, yoga kind of stuff, but with more magic. <laughs> so I mean, I'm completely atheist, but you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. I like, I'm really interested in, you know, following the natural cycles today as a full moon. What does that mean with th things to think about? So anyway, that's, that's kind of where my background was. I was just interested in this. And the more I was reading about it as an adult, I realized there's a lot of missed opportunities when it comes to um, our a critical relationship with other animals. So that's it in a nutshell. We can unpack some of that today. Oh, I have a question I'm dying to ask. Um, I was thinking that since uh, nature is often portrayed as uh, as feminine, as female, 
And that's something that's also reflected in language with phrases as, uh, I don't know, rape of nature or mother nature, things like that. And uh, sometimes um, nature is depicted as a fierce, uncontrolled, untamed woman uh, mm. that needs taming and others as a nurturing mother. And also very often women as seen as individuals closer to nature, perhaps more in sync with a, a lunar cycle, for yeah. example. And this parallel between women and nature has been used traditionally to subjugate both. Yeah. Uh, by uh, linking ourselves, women or feminism, with uh, re religious or spiritual practices that are based on a special relationship with nature, are we actually um, empowering ourselves or uh, do we run the risk uh, to uh, reproduce patriarchal stereotypes yeah. uh, in a way and uh, furthermore to, to um, upkeep dualism? By, uh, because uh, witchcraft, for example, is uh, often seen as some, some, something um, female, something feminine that has nothing to do with men. So, uh, because in a way, uh, witchcraft feels, feels natural to, to feminists in, in, in the sense that uh, the women that were seen as witches uh, were uh, feminists too, were not um, uh, what they are depicted to be, actually. So, uh, What's your take on that? That is an excellent, excellent point. And that is a debate I take up in this book. And that's actually a debate that's really core to eco-feminist thought, really. Because witchcraft today, there's a difference, to clarify for people who aren't familiar with you know, modern witchcraft. There's the witchcraft of the past, where people were you know, working with natural elements, working with uh, herbs and plants that were available to them, and basically making do in a time when you know we didn't have a lot of scientific evidence and you know, people didn't have access to doctors and traditional medicine so that was that was kind of the the old witchcraft and of course then there's all this you know sexist misogynist stuff that was dumped onto it and it was used as an excuse to you know exterminate quite a lot of women so modern witchcraft actually is a sort of uh, a reclaiming of that and a reimagining of it really and that's where i think it's really important with this book is i think if we were recreating reimagining witchcraft as a form of empowerment as speaking back to are pushing back against these old patriarchal systems, there's a lot of room to kind of recreate things in a more fair, equitable way. Because it's kind of a weird, it's so interesting you brought this up because it's this weird kind of interplay where we're resisting these old sexist stereotypes and we're taking back our power. But on the other hand, we're romanticizing that past in a way that's kind of reifying these gender roles and also reifying speciesism. Because that's one of the things in modern witchcraft is kind of this fantasy, this fantasy of we're close with the animals. And a lot of times that fantasy means using them, eating them. So in a lot of, just as an example, uh, my daily planner that I get every year, it has little um, crafts and recipes and stuff in there. Almost every single recipe in there has dead animals in it. And sometimes I say, oh, hunt the animal, go find a hunted. So this kind of romanticization of this old way with nature so you're right. Actually, in a way, it's resisting. It's it's taking back um, the stigmatized role that women had with nature and, and the elements. But on the other hand, it's also reifying it in a lot of ways. But also just to clarify that witchcraft today, whether it's secular or spiritual, this is a female dominated uh, religious practice, really. And it's a pushback against these the hierarchical types of traditional religions that are always, you know, male dominated and women usually don't have any kind of leadership positions in those. But I will say with modern witchcraft, although very much so it's dominated by women, it, there's also quite a lot of men who are involved in, involved in it. Some of the most famous books that were written on in modern witchcraft were written by men. Um, but absolutely it is, it is, um, it's a conundrum and that's stuff definitely one I want to pick apart in the book. Excellent first question. That's a good one. What do you think? Yeah, really great, really great question. Um, so I've I've got one. I don't know whether I want to get this because I know we might not have like the full hour with you, Corey. Um, and I wanted to ask this in terms of there's a there's a big overlap, and you mention in your proposal, um, and I think you're going to obviously break this down in the in the book as well a little bit more that you know eco feminist theory and how that um, how that can frame things and, and the connection with eco-feminism, witchcraft and um, kind of anti-speciesism, things like that. So my question on these kind of connections is with 
with eco-feminist theory, they, there's often a rejection of rights. Now, I don't know whether they, they kind of specify particularly um, legal rights as opposed to moral inherent rights, but they often reject rights as a, as a concept in, in terms of the theory of, you know, context and community and, and rejecting like rationalization and I ideas and ideals in that patriarchal way. But I just wonder how, because you do mention um, like trying to frame witchcraft uh, along with anti-speciesism and animal rights in a you know in, in through a different lens and i just wonder how abolitionist um inherent rights might kind of find their way into this um vegan witchcraft or how you see them connecting or can they sit together happily or not yeah. uh, well it's going to get really complicated because you know actually one of the reviewers for the proposal wrote back and says you're making a big assumption here that the witchcraft community today is even going to be leftist and even cares about that. I think the stuff that I follow, but a lot of it is there's a lot of vegans who are involved and a lot more critical thinking about non-human animals. But actually, just because you're a witch does it, and you're on the radical margins doesn't mean that necessarily that you're going to be leftist at all and even care about animal rights. So that's one thing. Um, there's quite a few books. There was a real kind of turn in the witchcraft community about 2019 quite a lot of books were published on witchcraft activism and that witchcraft activism is very much so um you know leftist it's, it's aligning with um uh, black lives matter environmental movements indigenous movements and things like that and from what i can tell thus far and again this is very preliminary because we have got a lot of research to do but what, from what i can tell so far witchcraft as a form of activism as a for, and, and honestly, that's kind of what witchcraft is about, is like not just taking for granted the way that the system is, thinking about how can mm -hmm. I actually empower myself and empower my community to make change, you know, setting an intention and manifesting that change. And that's not just, you know, hocus pocus stuff. It's like, this is literally what we do. We sit down and we set an intention and we manifest it using our own, you know, two hands or whatever. But what I'm seeing is that there, there's definitely a, a, a rights-based logic to what I've read thus far. And certainly for me, uh, I've, I've really grappled with that question. I suppose you have as well, Wendy, about you know, the eco-feminist critique of rights. And I think there's mm. a valid critique there because you know, what do rights mean in you know, a, a society that is not dominated by white male, like wealthy landowning, <laughs> you know, billionaires and stuff like that, because that's historically what the rights project was about protecting white wealthy men and their wealth. So how can we translate that to uh, the rest of us, marginalized groups? I do think that honestly, if we're living in a society now where rights are the main thing that can protect you, that extending rights is the way to go. But I also am quite aware that, that that's not that's not going to be all of it. We still need to do a lot more work beyond that. But that's a really good, interesting point. And I will actually be paying attention to that in these witchcraft books. Like, what do they think about, you know, these very legalistic, you know, especially the legal systems can, can be a bit like ugh, when it comes to the witchcraft community, given that long history of uh, persecution. Don't know. Mm, thank you. Yeah, it's going really, to be really interesting to uh, hear you explore all of that. Yeah, for sure. How long Ella, does, did you have does it usually take from proposal to publication? So when can we expect the book? Oh, God. But this is the funny thing. Like, Rootledge uh, approached me to see if I had any manuscripts available. And as I mentioned, or Wendy mentioned at the beginning, I'm working on vegan feminism. It's like my big project right now. So, so well, I don't, I'm not giving you that one. I want to see if I can get a university press for that one. But say, are you interested in this? And it's like, actually, this is one of the most interesting book proposals I've ever, I've ever read, she said. <laughs> but I said, oh, but I, I, can't, I can't dedicate 100% of my time to that to the book, unfortunately, because I have so many other writing projects on my desk. But I, I promised a manuscript to them by the end of 2025. So maybe okay. 2026. It'll be a while. It'll be a while. Maybe it'll get out earlier. I don't know. Let's see if I can hustle. Well that, well, that feeds into a comment um, from the chat, which is, I, I need this book, so it looks like we're going to... <laughs> we all need it. <laughs> we, all need, we all need it, for sure. It's very cool so, to be here right now because you're, you're feeding back some of the things that you think are important, some of the questions and dilemmas that you guys think are important. So this is really, really helpful, actually, for me. Cool. One, one of the... Um, 
things you talk about in the proposal is is about the foodways and things like that. Actually, the, um, I'm just looking at this quote here, if you don't mind me. Is it all right for me to read just a little quote from, yeah, from that? Or what you said? Um, <clears throat> Vegan witchcraft sees witchery as a powerful conduit for social change that draws its energy from plant-based foods, multi-species solidarity, and feminine power. <laughs> Sounds amazing. <laughs> <clears throat> it charges that the witch's path could and should be directed towards a just world. And that world can be manifested without the symbolic or material exploitation of non-human animals. And I just wonder if you might talk a little more on how you see vegan witchcraft um, kind of reframing the relationship with, uh, with other animals uh, as opposed to like modern witchcraft as it is today. Yeah, so as I, okay, so don't let me forget, there's at least two prongs here, one being yeah. plant-based eating and the other one multi-species solidarity. So the first one, with, with veganism, as I said, like I've got a stack of witchcraft books over my shelf over here and hardly any of them are even vegetarian. Um, yeah. well, I mean, they, they, usually they'll stick in recipes in there. I, I don't have any like full on witch uh, cookbooks, although there's that's a whole thing to its own. But yeah, on, oftentimes they'll put um, recipes in there as a way for people to kind of get their hands on, you know, working with herbs and spices and plants and stuff. And very, very rarely, very rarely are they um, uh, even vegetarian. And it's interesting because in a lot of these books, they talk about the power of herbs, the power of plants. And of course, now, hundreds of years later, we have some science to support this, that certain plants have effects on our body and can support us, or support us help our health and our well-being. Um, but they never really talk about that. It's, it's really interesting. Like they'll have page after page, like, oh, what nettle can do for you? Or, oh, if you eat blueberries, the antioxidants, and, oh. But then maybe they'll have a little bit to say about dairy. But then when it comes to dead animals, there's nothing like, oh, the power of pork, <laughs> like, what it does for you. So they intuitively know, I think, that, you know, this, that it's plants that are really the magical, the magical bit here that do so many good things for your body, whereas animal matter is dead matter, right? So I think there's room there to actually tease that out and say, you know, get with the times. <laughs> and actually, it's not just get with the times, because back when, again, this I'm, I'm interrogating this romanticization of early witchcraft days and say the 14, 15, 1600s, um, where this idea, let's get back to nature and live like our ancestors did. <laughs> so actually, the average person back then, a peasant, could not afford to be eating animal products anyway so actually being more vegan is getting in tune with your ancestors at least is even in the west even in the west here and then the other part of that is like i actually point to to, to food as a it's, like, it's almost a literal magic <laughs> because you're taking matter from the world that you you're taking you're picking you're forging you're buying whatever growing you're consuming it and then all these processes happen in your body that i mean we we've taken our science classes as kids but still it's a magical thing that kind of happens, this transferring of matter into energy. And you can do things with that energy, like be healthy, but also go fight for animal rights or go fight for uh, justice in your community or beyond. So that leads me to the second bit, which is the multi-species solidarity. Because I think it's a major, major, major missed opportunity that one of the big elements of the modern witchcraft uh, practice movement community is to celebrate this relationship we have with nature and with other animals. And again, a lot of this is actually fed into by the environmental movement, the back to nature movement that was also happening in the middle of the 20th century, which is when we saw the resurgence of witchcraft. Um, but it's a major, major missed opportunity because it often stops there. It's kind of, you know, it's speaking about animals in a sort of metaphorical way and speaking about my familiar, my dog or my cat is my familiar. <laughs> And, but not mm -hmm. actually thinking critically about these non-human animals are their own persons. A, and if a familiar means to be an extension of me, whereas I see my mm -hmm. dog and my cat as their own individual individual selves. But perhaps we could be comrades, you know, we take care of each other. We support one another in a world that's quite violent and oppressive. But also looking um, beyond that with the witchcraft community, one of the favorite things they do is they have spirit animals and totem animals and power animals or whatever you want to call it. And they all have animals like, you know, the wolf, the raven, or, you know, these magical animals, but never a cow or a chicken or a pig. These animals are on the dinner plate or in the cauldron, whatever you want to call it. And so they get re are rendered invisible. And so I'm, I'm pushing back on that and saying, actually, if we want to say we're finding power and finding um, 
our autonomy and independence and resilience in the natural world in our relationship with other animals let's take it seriously and think about what these other animals as individuals in them, themselves not just some totem animal to me or some familiar animal to me how are these animals comrades in a way and how can we work together in order to support the world that we or create the world that we we want to live in so that, that's two elements of it like actually mm -hmm. practicing what you're preaching <laughs> and going mm -hmm. vegan and, and looking at non-human animals not just as metaphors or symbols but as individuals i like the sound of this world I really do. There's a couple of comments, actually. I just wonder, I might go back. There's a couple of comments. I don't know if you want to address any of these, um, uh, Corey. So Marv Wheel says some transgender and non-binary people are also drawn to witchcraft. So I'm, I know you, you talk about kind of total liberation in the book. And then another question um, from Spiritual Vegan. Where is she gone? Um, eating... No, it wasn't that one. It was about cats. Oh, it was Deb. Sorry, Deb. Um, have cats always been part of witchcraft or is that a modern myth? Do you know anything about that? Okay. First, I want to respond to Marv. Good to see you, Marv. <clears throat> Marv. Marv is the administrator for um, my vegan feminist page. He's my good buddy. Um, an excellent point because that's something that is actually being introduced into the witchcraft community only recently thanks to the LGBT movement. So and that actually indicates to me we're starting to see other social movements infiltrate witchcraft, the Black Lives Matter, environmental, uh, LGBT, and I think there's space for the animal rights movement as well. But historically, in, at least in the modern witchcraft movement, well, I guess historically, we definitely know it was a binary, but in the modern witchcraft movement of the late 20th, early 21st century, it's very much so the feminine and the masculine. It's about mm -hmm. merging the binaries and celebrating both parts of who we are and da 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 and again, getting back to that essentialism stuff that we talked about earlier. But there's actually now some people who are pushing back and, and publishing books on, you know, what happens in the middle of that binary? What are the magical things that can be created when we're not like, squeezing um, energies or persons or whatever into these two either ors? So I think that's, that's going to be interesting. I'm going to definitely explore that in the book as well, because I think that might speak to our relationship with other animals. I have to really sit down and think about that. But I think that the advancements in, you know, the in trans rights and just kind of gender non-binaryism in general, there's a lot to do there. Uh, about cats. Um, I think, you know, cat, cats, but lots of other animals. And this is, I want to clarify this because the one of the reviewers for, for this manuscript kind of bounced back and said, it seems like you really think familiars existed in the past. And in a way they did. So obviously this, this notion of familiars that women have these, like they enchant these animals to go do their evil biddings. And interestingly, a lot of times that these women were persecuted for these, these evil doings, it was interfering with livestock, interfering with butter and milk production. So there's so much done back there. Um, but what I think it was, and I'm, I'm not going to take credit for this. I, I think someone did their dissertation on this topic. I uh, read it a few years ago. This idea, and again, this is coming from queer studies, like there's so much to learn here. Um, what you had was a lot of the women who were persecuted, and I know especially in the United States, a lot of the women who were persecuted were outsiders, marginalized, um, cranky, or not really integrated into the society, or maybe old maids, uh, i.e. women who resisted that patriarchal institution known as the family and marriage. So those women were very vulnerable, but a lot of those women, you know, it's just like today, single women, single people, live with cats they live with other animals and that's also those are also family members to them but those cats in particular this no, the idea that we have this crazy cat lady myth stereotype trope today i think pulls on this idea that women are resisting that patriarchal institution of family having kids marriage and they're living with cats instead and so it's sort of a queer resistance isn't it a queer family type so I think that that is kind of one of the reasons why this association between women and cats has persisted with this, the vegan stereotypes throughout the years, because what is the witch? The witch is a woman who does not abide, <laughs> women who resist patriarchy, women who fight back, women who do not get married and have a bunch of kids who decide maybe I'll have a bunch of cats. So I do think that that, that, was, that was part of it. And you know, a lot of these early witches as well were agricultural and people had cats you know, around for, for quote unquote pest control harass and mice and such. So that that's that's my theory on it, but I definitely want to unpack that. I think that there's there's uh, a lot to un uh, uncover there as far as what was actual and true in the 1415 and 1600s. 
cool question. Thanks. Uh, I was going Great to ask. Um, I was going to ask a Monty Python question about whether witches float, but um, I've got a more serious <laughs> one, uh, which is um, you. You talk about um, uh, non-human animal rights activists and also uh, vegans in relation to uh, green witchcraft. So, so you talked about green witchcraft and vegan witchcraft, and then you say, despite the overlaps between them, gr green witchcraft has not absorbed the vegan environmental ethic. And so in that sense, do you think it's very similar to something like Jainism? It's kind of all, all in the same ballpark, but not quite getting it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because <laughs> what it is, is these, these foundational ideals and then you have real life people who are being socialized not to see animals and no amount of like religious subculture is going to pull them out of that. I think, I think that's a very, very good comparison. Um, and by the way, just for, for people who aren't familiar with kind of the intricacies of witchcraft, there's like main, you could say witchcraft is, you know, what we've been talking about, but then you'll have people who are considered Wiccans. Wiccans are not secular. Wiccans, this actual religion for them. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because it was kind of created. It was a created religion and uh, like a hundred years ago, but then within witchcraft, secular or not, not secular, whatever, you'll have different kind of variations. So green witchcraft, those people who work with nature, work with plants and herbs, there's a uh, kitchen witchery, which I'm going to explore have a whole chapter on that as well, where people literally see their witchcraft as cooking in the kitchen. Again, there's, there's lots of interesting metaphors there. Um, but yeah, there's lots of variations on, on witchcraft, but I thought specifically witch, green witchcraft and kitchen witchery, and, and those are the more predominant ones, I would say, just talking about all these magical things about animals and, and all these magical things about plants and, and eating plant-based in a way, but then making space for dead animals. It's just kind of strange, a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting, that connection, isn't it? And how, how, so in modern witchcraft, how are the ways that you feel um, other animals are not being um, kind of honoured, respected? What, in what kind of ways are they, so you've already mentioned like the familiar as, a, as an extension of a human rather than a person in their own rights. Are there other ways that you have observed or, or kind of uh, researched in, in that, again, that they're not being honoured? Yeah, there's two and i can briefly explain one and but the second one i think is a little bit more um, sociologically interesting the first one is in a lot of witchcraft there is you have your your little tools and your your you know, things that you work with so you have like, some people who are into crystals and some people are into candles there's all different types of things but a lot of times dead animals are, are included in that so it's really hard to find um candles that aren't used using beeswax which we know today it's super easy anywhere to get candles that don't use bees but because in the witchcraft community it's all about romanticizing our connection with nature it's <laughs> bring in the bees so there's that there's lots of feathers and bones and yeah like skulls and stuff that people like to just find about that usually are animal derived and things like that so there's that i think that could be easily you know criticized and and reimagined the more interesting thing is witchcraft one of the thing that ties uh witchcraft the community and all these different practices together is a celebration of the wheel of the year and so basically witchcraft is pulling back on early pagan days in in the british isles where the 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 year was marked by different you know agricultural points this is when the animals move up to um, graze. This is when the animals give birth. This is when harvest, first harvest happens, the second harvest happens, third harvest happens. Now this is time when slaughtering happens and so on. And, so, and then it just goes around. And so like, for instance, we just had the summer equinox on June 21st. That's a major one. Coming up uh, August 1st is Lunasa, which means in Irish, August. <laughs> And that's a big harvest one and that's grain related. So that one's pretty cool. But then there's a lot of them that are around the livestock kind of agricultural points of the year, which get where it gets problematic. So for instance, early Easter, Easter use, uh, is based on um, a, a time in the agricultural year where animals would start to give birth and lactate. And so that would be a lot of, um, there's in, in the modern witchcraft practice, then it's a lot of stuff about uh, eggs, doing magic with eggs, eating lambs and all this kind of look. 
But the more interesting one, so I want to make sure I get this one out because I think this 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 is one of the things that really got me thinking about wanting to write this book is Samhain. And Samhain is a word for, it means November in Irish. And what Samhain is, it's the witch's new year. It's October 31st. And mm. that is, uh, historically, that's the day or the time of year when the animals would have been, you know, as big as they're going to get. And now they're going to be slaughtered so that they can be used. Their bodies can be eaten throughout the winter, dark months when uh, plants couldn't, are, are not available. And so it was a massive day of, you know, a massive time of the year where there's lots of death. And, and uh, also there's a lot of reflection. So it's not just animals are being killed, sacrificed, but humans are thinking about this is when the veil is the thinnest and we're thinking about our ancestors. And so really it's sort of a day of death, a day of remembering in a literal way and in a figurative way. And then the interesting thing is, again, we have a lot of Christian overlay over that. So then November 1st is, 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 a, is, a, is it St. Nicholas's Day or something? I can't remember which one it is. But interesting, the, the vegan society, when it wanted to decide when its uh, World Vegan Day would be, they chose November 1st because October 31st being the day of death. <laughs> and so they were thinking about, well, we can you know, have the contrast being on the next day, a day, this day of life and day of like renewal. And so it's just kind of interesting there that this, 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 the vegan societies, I don't think that they were thinking witchcraft and paganism, but again, they're thinking, because there was a point in the vegan society's history where they were very much so influenced by Christianity and they were thinking about framing their stuff in Christian terms. I think they decided on ve the vegan day in the 90s or something like that. But again, there's something really interesting there. So how can we reimagine the wheel of the year, not around, you know, sacrificing and killing animals and using animals, but thinking about the wheel of the year in, you know, a more symbiotic relationship with other animals and free living animals and, you know, harvesting our plants and fruits and grains and things like that. So that's a major place because that's what I think that's one of the things that kind of that practice that brings all the witches together is that these are the certain days of the year that we, we come together and think about certain things. How can we then think more critically about historically how how animals were treated and the other thing is also we have to remember with the persecution of women like the persecution and also some men in the united states um, quite a few men were also killed for witchcraft but how can we think about um remembering and honoring those ancestors and then also remembering and uh, honoring non-human animals but the problem is today we're still sacrificing so the witchcraft community is trying to say we're you know, we're different from those patriarchal institutional religions mm -hmm. because we're back to nature. It's like, no, you guys are doing animal sacrifice too. And in a way, you're also practicing patriarchy because you're oppressing, you're oppressing non-human animals and you're oppressing nature. And so it's, where's the feminism here? <laughs> you're also mm -hmm. engaging in this systemic violence. Mm -hmm. Love that, love that. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I was just going to say, can you bring that up? No, 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 I was just going to ask you to bring that up. With Raymond Buckland, and is, is this a, an idea that would be a pushback towards green witchery? You know, the idea that plants feel pain, and so therefore... I wonder if Darren can give me a citation on that. Raymond Buckland is one of the most famous um, authors in the modern witchcraft community. He's passed on now, I think in the mid uh, to late 20th century, he wrote a lot of the foundational texts. So if Darren can pass on the citation, I would love to tackle that one. Sorry, I spoke over you there. Uh, he's, he's, very, he's very prolific, so I, I need to know which one, where that came from. No, I was going to ask you to bring that comment up, actually. You were literally, obviously, my witchcraftery was working because you read, <laughs> you read my, I projected it out there without you, um, even I... <laughs> But there's another one as well. I would. I wonder if you could bring up actually, um, Roger, which is uh, Vegan Graham at 6.32. Easter came from the goddess, which was a renewal and a rebirth. So, yeah, it, it, so it just seems sometimes as if sometimes things um, maybe have an origin in a, in a respectful practice, mm. perhaps like renewal and rebirth, and then are kind of... Uh, maybe co-opted, I don't know if that's the right word, but and, and get co-opted into oppression or oppressive practices. Do you, are you aware of this one, Corey? I'm sure you are, yeah. the pagan stuff. Yeah, so this is another case of that romanticization. But so mm. you also, so you also, a lot of these, these, these witchcraft practices come from Celtic Ireland as well. And I've, as you know, I've written a book about um, veganism, vegetarianism in Ireland. 
and a lot of early Catholic practices in Ireland, medieval Ireland especially, it called for vegetarianism or vegan, really in a lot of cases, straight up veganism and sometimes um, complete fasting. And then over the years, as we start to get more wealthy and speciesism, the, the species of animal agriculture is now kind of all around us. People have been socialized now to kind of rework their religious practices to, you know, I think there's like debates, there's debates every once in a while, what counts as animal because on Friday or during Lent, you're supposed to give mm -hmm. give that up. And, you know, obviously people are still eating fishes and there's some weird, there's some other, some other species that's considered, they, they consider it's okay to eat. Even Here, though, uh, for orthodox, orthodox Christians, you can consume any animal um, who has not blood. So uh, you could eat crabs, for example, okay. or uh, lobster or yeah, uh, that random uh, yeah. differentiation between species. Just twisting the rules, twisting the rules, twisting the rules, because we live in such a meat-heavy species of society now that these religious practices, as they were devised hundreds of years ago, don't seem to make sense, or they seem way more extreme now, and at the time, they didn't seem extreme. And a lot of this, actually, I don't want to misconstrue that some of this, these early practices were because they respected animals. A lot of it was because mm -hmm. the fasting, for instance, and certain times of fasting was because they were times when it, it, it was there's not much food around, and so fasting made sense to conserve. But what I find interesting is that in many cases, um, Christianity, Christian, uh, although uh, they denounced pagan practices, they actually incorporated uh, pagan rituals and traditions in, into into the religion, so it could be spread. Uh, I cannot uh, imagine another reason for that. Yeah, yeah. But I think the other, the interesting thing about that is it demonstrates that for religion or, you know, secular practice, whichever way you want to look at witchcraft, but any of these types of practices, religious or not, in order for them to survive, they have to be flexible, they have to adapt. And so obviously, we're talking about Christianity, we're talking about witchcraft, these have all been adapted to a species of society. So they make sense to people, and it's easier for people to follow. But what I'm what I see from that also is that it can be reversed because we are now living in a state of climate crisis. We're now living in a world where violence against animals is at level so extreme it can't be fathomed. But so that demonstrates that we're, we're reaching a point where we cannot continue with the speciesism as it has been. And that's it's a it's a testament that these practices can be you know changed in order to accommodate social justice, climate justice. Mm -hmm. It all seems all very interconnected holistically, doesn't it? As um, as Linda's comment said, um, just there's a there's a question here, and this might end up being your last one, Corey, because I'm I'm aware of time, and I know that you um, have to zip off. Um, but I think this is quite a good question for this is the one <laughs> for a scientist. I think this is a really good question to ask you. Do any witchcraft principles or beliefs conflict with or contradict accepted science? Oh. Uh. Well, yeah, there's, <laughs> um, like I said at the beginning, there's, there's two types of witchcraft. There's the people who are, you know, they believe it just like with any religion. They believe just like with a Christian who prays and thinks I'm going to make some miracle happen. It's just a witch who's I'm going to do the spell and I'm going to make this miracle happen. There's people who do that. But I, I would say that another group of people who realize that it's the intention, the psychological intention there, focusing your efforts, planning what you want to do and manifesting something. So there's people who come about it in a more rational way. And then there's some people who come about it in a traditional religious way, not really necessarily thinking about it very critically. It's like, this is what I do. And da, da, da. So there's definitely, you can pick up a lot of woo-woo witchcraft books. I'm not going to deny that. But as I said, I'm an atheist. I'm a secular witch. <laughs> and I'm all about, you know, thinking about advocating for animal rights in a scientific way. What's the evidence? What's going to work? But the purpose of this book is, I just think it's neat. I think that there is, it's a, there's a resurgence in secular modern witchcraft. It's a, it's a big thing now. And book sales are going through the roof. More and more people coming out as being a witch. And if this is something perhaps we can tap into, right? Because we have lots of work that's on Christian, Christianity and veganism and animal rights, a little bit on Judaism, a little bit even less on Islam, et cetera, a little bit on atheism. But what about this? What about these more feminist types of religious and spiritual practices? I think there's just philosophically some interesting stuff to unpack there. Thank you. Mm. Brilliant. Um, I don't know if you, it's, we're coming up to 40 minutes now, Corey. I don't know if you have to 
jump off at all. I can take. Uh, I can hang on for five more minutes. I I I want. Yeah, sorry. Did no, no Sorry. Did you have? Go, go, ahead, Wendy, go ahead, Wendy. Go ahead. No, please do because I've spoke loads. Please do. I, I wanted to. Um, Rafa, if you can tell a little more about of the parallels between feminism today and witchcraft. Uh, can you repeat that? Sorry, Nella. Uh, if you can say a little more about uh, feminism today and, and witchcraft and how these, uh, these two are connected. Yes, there's a whole big resurgence in the 1970s and the 1980s. I think it's kind of interesting if, if you're familiar at all with the vegan ecofeminists, if you look back in their early writings, a lot of it is super spiritual. <laughs> like really religious and as someone like me who's like atheist like i don't is ecofeminism for me i feel a bit alienated and that's why i think i'm drawn to witchcraft because i'm just a, you know it's a thing to guide me in life but it's you know not not religious in any way um but there was also i think a lot of uh witchcraft feminist theory that was coming out of the 1970s and the 1980s where it was really was seen like if we stop thinking about God ruling society and ruling the world and thinking about a goddess and what does that mean? And this is all, this is where it gets into a lot of the kind of religious woo woo -wee stuff that I'm not as familiar with, but that's a whole thing. If you ever go to Glastonbury <laughs> and you go to the goddess temple there, it's all about worshiping the goddess. But I wonder if some of that honestly is not just, you know, the super religious woo woo stuff, but perhaps actually an active resistance to um, patriarchal norms in our society and, and, and the feminist idea of what if we put women at the center? And so that I can respect. And I, I think that's probably where you see a lot of overlap with witchcraft and feminism for sure. Okay. I would have thought second wave feminism would, would fit really well. The idea of rebels and um, you know, the kind of FU aspect uh, to it. And uh, Corey, just before you go, uh, where where is it? Where is it? Um, you can um, you can let down one of our one of our regular viewers here mm -hmm. soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Deb, we, we 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 think we think what two two thousand and what twenty twenty five? I think. Did you no, say I have Corey? to deliver the manuscript by end of twenty twenty five, and then it should be out oh, in twenty twenty six. That's because I have. A couple of other books I'm working on. So, so you, <laughs> you've got to submit your manuscript, and then they do their magic on it. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have to. I'm submitting three chap. By the end of the year, they'll have three chapters, and then it goes out for review, so they can d determine which way it's going to go. Because one of the big issues that the reviewers had was it didn't sound academic enough, and it's like, well, <laughs> it's really just a philosophical exploration. In a lot of ways, it's inspired by my activism, like reading all these books and just getting pissed off because I'm tired of them treating animals like ingredients when you're supposed to be this nature-based group of people. So, yeah. So, yeah, I have to the, think about that. In, in the meantime, people can go to our Vegan Feminist Network. You can find your articles there and many very interesting articles on vegan feminism. Uh, and actually, they are all for free. So you can read like throughout summer. Yeah, there's a re there's a massive back catalogue of articles in there and some yeah really great essays. And I think are you did you say Corey that you've, some of your um your your other book about vegan fe feminism is kind of putting together some of that stuff on on the vegan feminist yeah. network, it's kind of drawing yeah, it together. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up because that that book is going to be my magnum opus, I think. <laughs> This is a culmination of 10 years of working with Vegan Feminist Network and all those themes. And now it's been 10 years and there's certain themes that I've, I still am the only one that's really writing about them. And so I feel like this is going to be the book where I introduce a lot of those super radical feminist critiques of what's going on in the animal rights movement, because a lot of our feminist, vegan feminist work is outward facing. It's so about women's relationship with animals, men's relationship with meat or whatever, but not so much research about what's happening in our movement. So. I know, Wendy, we were looking at some stuff about bikinis from be beagles oh or whatever, that kind of stuff that I think we need to have a conversation about. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh. Can, you, can you repeat that? Did, what did you say? What I thought you were <laughs> All right, this is all right, this is the thing. Wendy messaged me the other day with a link. <laughs> oh my god, have you seen this? And that's all it said. And I clicked it, and it was this woman like in some pornographic stance, like barely covered. And I was like, I think she's been hacked. 
and just sent me some porn spam. And then I was <laughs> somewhere in the fine print, it says bikini contest for beagles or something. Is that right? Yeah. Bikini protest um, oh, outside, yeah, MVR. Yeah. We've been told oh, yes, they go for clothes to be heard. All right, so it's not beagles in bikinis. Okay, I'm good, you know. Bikini. Okay. No, Corey literally was going, Wendy, I think you might have been hacked. You just sent me some spam porn. I was like, no, this is for real. <laughs> and Corey was like, what? <laughs> does, does Hitchens uh, feature in your book uh, so far, Corey? But what about the experience of Numinous as expressed by the late Christopher Hitchens? Well, I didn't. To be fair, I've not really read much of his stuff. I'm going to make a note to explore that. Thank you. Okay. This is very helpful. It's, I'm really glad you guys have me on today. I appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you coming on as Here well. to serve, here to serve. And we're <laughs> going to ask you back uh, for a session on uh, vegan feminism because there is so much happening in, within the movement, so yeah. much misogynistic stuff happening. And uh, you very often hear people saying that it's uh, liberating. Uh, well, in reality, it's, it's oppressive. Um, There's so much to unpack, Mila. There's so much to unpack. Yeah, well, that's, uh, a whole, that's a whole five shows that right there. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> and have I have the, the chapter that I'm sending out with the proposal, or I have sent the proposal's already been sent out. I'm waiting for the re reviewers to get back, but I have a chapter, a sample chapter, on the sexualization of veganism, which I've just collected so many images from like Veganuary where they just make vegan food look sexy or even pornographic. Mm -hmm. And it's this whole trope. This is whole trope to unpack. It's like, what does that mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, and I can get into that, but I won't because it's, there's not enough time for it. But okay. have me back sometime and we'll talk about. Yes, please. please. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> yep. Anytime. <laughs> and thanks, everybody. Yeah. For the Thank you seeing the comments on the side and thanks everybody for the tips and the questions and the conundrums and the areas to explore because this book is very much so a work in pro progress as i said it's going to be a, a few years yeah thank you thank you for um for everything all your work i i often whenever i've got a conundrum myself about things especially to do with like misogyny of vegan feminism anything like that i'm straight onto the vegan feminist network and i just scan through corey's articles and then i'm like linking linking like mad to people like like you know come on have a look at this so yeah yeah no it's um great back catalog of work though so thank i really appreciate all your work corey it just gives us such a something to hook into and 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 your theory and your research and everything you know it's 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 got real gravitas to it and it's it's really good to have that as a as a backup for what we're trying to do as well so thank you <laughs> thank you i really appreciate it it's really awesome for you to say that and because you know when you write you're oftentimes the lone writer and <laughs> is anyone yeah. out there? i appreciate that thank you we're out here <laughs> oh, yes definitely yeah so thanks so much and in the meantime have a magic summer yeah are you going to disappear in a little puff of smoke? <laughs> oh, she did! <laughs> yes, you did. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> I really like this music. I'm have to set this as some kind of alarm for when I get up in the morning because that would suit me much better than the ones. It's called Summoning the Witch. Summon. Very appropriate. Yeah. Summon the Witch, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that, that was a that was a general idea. <laughs> so um, we've got uh, ten minutes maximum, and th and that's yes. a maximum because these yeah. these other shows are going to be one hour maximum. We've decided, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, uh, since uh, since we have a few minutes, I wanted to ask uh, Wendy about uh, the protest yesterday and the wonderful speech she delivered. Oh. Um. Thank you, Thank Nella. You um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was at um, an event yesterday which was organised by We Stand for the Animals and um, Hannah organises that and, sh and she's been organising that along with, uh, you know, um, her team, been organising that for the last, I think it's three three years now. So it's basically a memorial service for all our fellow animals and we um, stand in formation um, and I know there are other groups who do this as well, but we stand in formation and um, the front rows will be holding bodies of other animals that have passed. Um, 
and the rows behind were holding placards, each representing a different uh, individual of a different species of other animals. So it's it's very respectfully done. It's basically like um, uh, yeah, a memorial service or a funeral service. And Hannah then reads a speech and she she talks about anti-speciesism, she talks about animal rights, and then she will also talk about each one of the individuals whose bodies are there represented and their experiences in the world and the way that they're used um, by by humans and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's all very moving, it's all very uh, respectfully done. And then we have a two minute silence for all the other animals there and all the ones that we think of and are and the ones that we remember personally as activists and also you know for the the plight of um all non-human animals and then um a white rose is laid on top of the 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 other animals to represent peaceful protest um and then they are taken over and and later on hannah and and her partner go and give them a very respectful burial so it's all very beautifully done and then um hannah kindly asked me to to give a speech there were eight eight speakers there in fact Ronnie I think is Ronnie still here as he as he jumped off Ronnie was there as well Ronnie Lee was given a speech and um I had the the I called it the short straw of follow, following Ronnie Lee um but Ronnie kindly filmed my speech for me and I filmed his so so I was speaking after Ronnie and um I gave a speech all about speciesist language so I called it um I, as a nod to Joan Denea I uh, with her brilliant book Animal Equality I called it um Beyond species, beyond speciesism, language and liberation, and it was all about the language that we use, the oppressor's language, and how we ought to be using our language as a political and radical tool for change, whether we see it as grammatically correct or not. In at times, you know, like calling other animals, it is obviously a very basic one, but but you hear that like all over the place, even from vegans and activists. So, um, yeah, I kind of I gave that speech. Wendy, what do you think? Um, well, <laughs> Ronnie, if you're still here, you can, I don't know if Ronnie's still here now, because I think he, I haven't seen him for a little while, but Ronnie did have a, a comment about, <laughs> about, about what he might do at MBR, but I don't think I should share it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, speak to Ronnie about that one, Vegan Graham, <laughs> directly, because I don't want to share his secrets. <laughs> but Ronnie but, um, yes. never keeps any secrets, he, he, he just tells everybody everything. This is this is true, but I I'm, I don't want to divulge other people's things. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was so the speech went well. All the speeches were 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 really really good, and um, it was great to hear. There was a real variety of different a uh, different. Speeches. Are they going to be online? Um, when, when are we going to be able to see them? I think they will be. I think there was a videographer there, and he was filming everyone. And um, yeah, I think they'll come out online. I don't know at what point, but I'm sure at some point soon once he's got everything together. And I don't know if he's doing any editing or anything like that, but. So yeah, that'll be that'll be something that's coming out soon. Yeah, so thank you for asking me that, Nella. I really appreciate you've that. Told on, you've told on a great topic, language. It's so important. Yeah. Well, actually, Hannah was the one who approached me about it. I think she knew that I felt really strongly about it, really passionate about it. And she she says herself that she often will pull people up and and um talk about non-speciesist language. And she said she wanted someone to talk about it. And as she knew that I felt passionate about it, she said, please come and talk about this. So yeah. And I was delighted to do that. I was I was really delighted to be able to have that platform to just talk about that because I don't think it's it, we speak about it within the movement, but I don't think it's often spoken about at protests and things like that. Or I, I haven't witnessed that so much. So yeah, it's really, it was really good. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Well, there is yeah. a Facebook page, isn't there, called Unlearning Species Language? If people want to explore that, yeah. So that's one. Yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant um, page, and really useful tool for everyone and because and as I said in the speech none of us are going to be perfect it's not about shaming each other and um you know trying to make make each other feel bad but it's about supporting each other to to act in a more political way like not think like oh but it doesn't sound good and it doesn't sound right it's like sometimes you might not feel comfortable and always look at the context but there are ways that we can all use our language radically each and every day in so many different situations with different people so it's actually a form of activism that we can do that doesn't really cost us anything that doesn't take a lot of our time and it's something that we can sow seeds on every single day so it's just i think something that's really important and words matter yes Deb. very very true i, I think that was part of my speech so <laughs> words are, are powerful and they matter 
So yeah, they're weapons. Uh, Nella, what you been up to? Uh, not much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that answer. The quickest answer that the animal rights show has ever had. I love that. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I have uh, participated uh, in uh, a few protests, like regular stuff happening uh, everywhere. Nothing, uh, nothing major to to report. I may have something major to report in a while, but not yet. Uh, as, all, as all those fires and all that, is that over and done with now? Or? Sorry, I didn't hear you. You know, the, the fires in, in Greece. They, they haven't started yet. I mean, usually uh, they happen uh, uh, mid-July uh, throughout August. Uh, we hope uh, they don't happen every year, but they do. I mean, I, I, I don't remember a sum, summer without bushfires. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you were very upset about uh, what was going on and, and, and stuff. And the, I think you gave us an account during one of the shows, didn't you, which was really yes. quite mm. harrowing. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I hope I don't have to do it again. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Um, okay, well, um, well let's Are we within the hour? Out. Yeah, we, we're, 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 we've it? got four minutes. Um, I probably <gasps> would like to finish, if I may, with just a line from Corey's proposal which i thought was really good oh um, yes. it said non-humans could serve as comrades rather than commodities in resistance to the anthro park uh parkle society i probably said that wrong um but the witch community would first need to challenge the normalcy of species inequality first as it were and so um in terms of the um in the terms of the challenge from Corey's book, it sounds really kind of good, almost like um, this is a good idea, but you need to veganize essentially. I suppose it um, that's what it's saying, you know, and, and these are the reasons why, which, which is yeah. using your own internal arguments, I guess. So, yeah. yeah, it's been consistent, isn't it, with your own? Yeah, yeah everybody own can't own wait for 2025 now, right? So, I can't wait for this book, I think it's going to be brilliant. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, people. So, um, yay! Yes, we'd like to we thank in the hour. And uh, we we had our, our um, golden oldie from the beginning of the show, and so this is the golden oldie from the end. So, thanks very much, everyone. And we'll yeah, see thanks you everyone. Yeah. Thanks for your comments. Good Bye. to see everyone. <laughs>